yeah so <clears throat> good morning uh, good evening uh, okay to the indian participants of course it's good morning and it's a great day for us uh, uh, to have uh, dr william phillips the 1997 nobel laureate in physics and uh, he is of course from joint quantum institute national institute of standards and technology and also belong to university of maryland uh it's it's great pleasure today to host him uh in this asset colloquium and uh, for those of you and i see quite a lot of you uh, who are uh, joining from outside the tifr uh, family tifr institute uh, uh you must be wondering what is the asset means for asset stands for advances in science engineering and technology this is mainly a forum where talks like this uh, which are stretching from uh you know the uh, the instrumentation the detectors the electronics uh in the, all the engineering and technology related topics that are relevant to the science uh, and medicine and so on are are uh, presented uh the asset colloquium organizes uh, the talks usually at 4 pm indian standard time on fridays but uh, as you can guess today the speaker is uh, you know is talking now from the other side of the globe in fact at 11 pm uh, in us and so this special timing today and uh, to just go back uh, set uh, colloquium also complements the other two colloquia that happens at tifr uh, one on wednesday at 4 pm which is natural sciences faculty colloquium and the other one is a mathematics colloquium that happens on thursdays at uh, at 4 o'clock so we have these three colloquia series that happens every week discussing the natural sciences uh, topics stretching from physics chemistry biology computer science and the mathematics of course and also the instrumentation and uh, you know the electronics and data and systems and other topics and also some of the talks in popular science and that all happens under asset colloquia so uh, i can guarantee that this is going to be one of the best colloquia probably you've heard uh in your uh, career so maybe i shouldn't in fact take too much time uh in in kind of announcing this uh but without taking uh, you know more time uh, between you and the speaker let me right away invite uh, professor stephen impanathan from american college madurai who was actually responsible for making this talk happen and uh, i also want to invite among from many of my tfr colleagues and a lot of you from there uh professor sunil gupta who is the uh, the chair of the cosmic commission c4 who is also a good friend of the speaker so with that let me hand over uh, the podium to stephen in uh thanks uh, dr satya good afternoon good evening good morning to everyone i am stephen ilmanathan associate professor at the american college madurai which was started in the year 1881 by the american missionaries I am delighted to have the distinct honor to introduce today's speaker, Dr. William Daniel Phillips. Bill was graduated from Geneva College in Pennsylvania with a Bachelor's of Science in Physics in 1970. He went on to receive his PhD in 1976 from MIT under the direction of one of the most well-renowned, well-respected, and international heroes of atomic physics, Dr. Dan Klepner. after two year postdoc at mit bill joined the staff at the national institute of technology and began his remarkable research career over the years he has won numerous awards way too many to list but among those that are notable was his election to be a nist fellow service to american award presidential rank award appointed as an academician of the pontifical academy of sciences Rich Mayer Award of the American Association of Physics Teachers. Bill, still a pioneer and a leading researcher in the field of laser cooling and trapping of neutral atoms. His research has led to new kinds of measurements and processes such as high resolution spectroscopy, atomic clocks and atom interferometry. His work led to his being awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 19 97 for developing of methods to cool and trap atoms with the laser light he found that atoms could be cooled far below what was then believed to be the cooling limit with this short introduction i hand over the mic to 
user. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, that kind introduction, Stephen. It's a, a pleasure to be here to speak to you virtually from uh, nearly the other side of the world. And, uh, uh, and from yesterday, uh, it's Tuesday where I am, and it's a, a pleasure to be talking to you uh, tomorrow. Uh, time is such a, an interesting uh, feature of our lives, and I'll be talking a lot about time uh, today. Uh, as you've heard, I'm from the Joint Quantum Institute from NIST and the University of Maryland. And at NIST, I'm part of the Laser Cooling and Trapping Group. And my group leader, uh, Gretchen Campbell, leads a group of people, including Paul Lett, Trey Porto, Ian Spielman, Ida Tietzinger, Charles Clark, and Nicole Younger-Halpern. And these are the people with whom it's my great pleasure to work on a daily basis. Uh, I'm also uh, representing uh, uh, not only NIST, but also uh, the International Union of Pure and Applied Physics. And I'm a member of Commission C2, which among its duties has the responsibility for uh, uh, units and, uh, uh, and, and standards. And so uh, I'm spreading the word about this uh, quantum reform of the international system of units of the international metric system uh, under the auspices of IUPAP. So um, a revolutionary quantum reform of the metric system. What is this quantum reform? Well, uh, on the 20th of May, 2019, which is World Metrology Day, we have experienced the greatest revolution in measurement since the French Revolution. The nature of the revolution is uh, a change to the international system of units. The international system of units, the, the, the international metric system has as its base units, the kilogram, the meter, the second, the ampere, the Kelvin, the mole, and the candela. All other uh, physical quantities are expressed in terms of these base units of the international system of units, what we call the SI. And the revolution that has occurred is that today, every one of those base units is defined by fixing the values of fundamental constants of nature. Now, in order to see how it's possible that this can be done and how an earlier unit, namely the, the second, the unit of time, uh, had this done to it, and with apologies to the late, great Stephen Hawking, I'm going to bring you my version of A Brief History of Time. For a very long time, we have uh, uh, had uh, the second to be a certain fraction of a day. Uh, a, a second is uh, a day divided by uh, 60 seconds in a minute times 60 minutes in an hour times 24 hours in a day. So uh, a second was one day divided by 86,400. The problem was, what is a day? Well, it might be obvious what a day is, the time it takes for the earth to rotate, but since at least the year 1900, we have known that the length of the day changes. Uh, the tides create a friction force that slows down the rotation of the earth. Uh, earthquakes and uh, changes in ocean currents change the rotation of the earth by changing the moment of inertia of the earth or by changing the, the angular momentum of the, uh, uh, of, of the movable parts of the earth. So uh, it became necessary to have some other way of determining what we mean by time, since it was clear that the earth was not a very good standard. Well, one of those ways is atomic clocks. And here's a picture of the first atomic clock uh, that was at the National Bureau of Standards, the predecessor of NIST, where I work. In fact, it was a molecular clock. It used uh, uh, an ammonia uh, molecule as the standard ticker. And this was in 1949. It was the first atomic clock and it was significantly better than the rotation of the earth. Uh, a few years later at the uh, National Physical Laboratory of the United Kingdom, uh, they made a cesium clock. Uh, here's a picture of that early cesium clock in, uh, in 1955. 
Uh, and here the ticker for the clock was uh, the cesium atom. And uh, uh, in 1960, with this new technology that was more than a decade old, the technology of atomic clocks, and with it being clear that the Earth's rotation as a definition for the second was not sufficient for the needs of, uh, of modern time metrology, they changed the definition of the second. They changed the definition of the second to a fraction of the year 1900. What were they thinking? It's certainly true that the year 1900 doesn't change, but it's not exactly readily available for measurement today. Well, eventually they saw the error of their ways. And in 1967, uh, they, uh, the international community adopted a new definition of time that the second was the duration of some 9 billion cycles of the radiation that corresponds to uh, the transition between two hyperfine levels in cesium. And that is still the definition of time today. Uh, how does it work? Well, this is a very simplified version of the idea of, of an atomic clock. Here is a, a simplified cartoon version of a cesium atom. We have a nucleus that has a spinning nucleus that has a magnetic moment. Uh, we have the valence electron. Uh, there's a magnetic field produced by these, uh, uh, these spinning objects. And the orientation of the electron relative to the nucleus results in a change of energy. When you put in microwaves at just the right frequency, then the electron will flip its spin. But if the frequency is not right, then the, uh, nothing changes. The, uh, 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 the spin does not flip. So all you have to do to make an atomic clock, and this is a tremendous oversimplification, you just tune the microwaves until the uh, electron makes a transition, and then you know that the frequency of the microwaves is exactly this number. So basically what has been done is that we've taken a quantum transition in the cesium atom and defining what its frequency is to be exactly this number. We've uh, been using these, these atomic clocks uh, since uh, 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 the, the 1950s, and this plot shows how they've been improving over time. They keep getting better. And so by the 1990s, these clocks were good to about a part in 10 to the 14. The trouble is that they pretty much stalled at that level of precision. Why? Because the atoms are moving so fast. It means that the atoms are soon out of the apparatus. Here's a picture of one of the best of those clocks. The atoms are moving along at a few hundred meters per second, and so they only stay in the apparatus for a few milliseconds. Furthermore, the ticking frequency of the atoms is changed uh, by the motion because of the, the Doppler shift. An observer in the laboratory watching moving atoms will see that there's a, a Doppler shift, a quite substantial one, and all sorts of tricks have to be used to get rid of that. In addition, there's the time dilation, which uh, Einstein taught us about in 1905. These moving atoms are like moving clocks and moving clocks run slow, as Einstein taught us with his special relativity theory. And so uh, these clocks, while remarkably good at a part in 10 to the 14, didn't get much better because of the fact that the atoms were moving so fast. This problem was addressed by laser cooling, which is something I've spent a lot of my career uh, working on. And uh, this allowed the atomic clocks to get even better. So that today those atomic clocks are good to a few parts in 10 to the 16. Time is the most accurately measured quantity in the international system of units. And so you can see what has happened here. We've taken something that was rather arbitrary, namely the rotation of the earth, and we've replaced the definition of time based on that arbitrary uh, artifact-like uh, feature, the rotation of the earth. We've replaced it with a quantum transition of an atom, something that we expect will never change with time or with location, unlike the rotation of the earth, which can change for all sorts of reasons. So this is a very important concept. We change uh, the definition from something that could itself be changeable 
to something that we expect to be completely stable, namely a quantum transition in a, and an atom in this case. So let me stop right here and see whether there are any questions. We should have mentioned that we're going to take questions at a number of times during the, uh, this talk. And if you have uh, questions, you can write them into the chat on YouTube or into the, the chat on Zoom, or you can raise your hand to uh, call attention to yourself and ask the question live. Uh, I'll be very happy to answer any questions. So do we have questions, Stephen? Yeah, Bill, right now, uh, I don't see uh, questions yet. I did uh, type in a message uh, early on, uh, asking them to type in either in YouTube or, or in the Zoom. Uh, but I guess uh, there will be more when you have the second stop. Okay, so uh, think of some questions, if you have any, and uh, write them down in, in, in the chat or just write them down in a note to yourself and ask them the next time. But let's go on from here. So that's time. Next, I'd like to bring you a short history of length. Time was important in ancient times, but length was really important because it involved commerce and it involved construction. Uh, the early approach to length used the human body as a standard. Uh, a foot was a foot. A yard was the distance between your nose and the end of your fingers. Uh, the cubit was the distance from the elbow to the tips of your fingers. This was really convenient. You always had your standard of length with you, but the problem was that it was not consistent. Uh, a, um, if you were buying uh, fabric, for example, from a short fabric merchant, you might not get what you expected because the, uh, the standard of measurement uh, is not consistent from one person to another. Well, what, what shall you do? Well, one approach was to make the standard of measurement relative to the body of a particular person, the monarch of a country. Here, the, the pharaoh of Egypt uh, was the basis for the standard of the royal Egyptian cubit. So um, uh, the problem was that you didn't always have the pharaoh around to make your measurements. So they made an artifact. Here's a picture of the stone version of the royal cubit of Egypt. They made a, uh, uh, an object out of stone that was equal in length to the length of the pharaoh's forearm, and that became the standard for the entire uh, empire of Egypt. It was used with secondary standards that were made out of wood to, uh, to measure the pyramids. And people were very serious about their metrology. They were required by law to recalibrate their wooden standards every month against the primary standard, the, uh, the stone standard. And there was a death penalty if you didn't do the recalibration every month. So they were very serious about metrology. And one of the results was that the pyramids are amazingly well constructed. The baselines are consistent to a small fraction of a percent. They're square to 12 arc seconds. Uh, these are really remarkable buildings because of the seriousness of the metrology of these, uh, of these ancient Egyptians. And that spirit was widespread throughout the world. For example, in Europe, it was very common for length standards to be built into uh, the walls of the city. Here is a, uh, a length standard, a fathom, uh, that would be the spread of one's arms in the city hall uh, of the, the, the city of Regensburg in Germany. And you can see by comparison to this tourist, it was a pretty long fathom. So this may, might have been a good place to buy fabric. But if you were to go into one of the surrounding towns, you would find a completely different standard of length. And this was a really difficult problem, uh, but it was a very widespread problem as well, uh, that there was no consistency in the standard of length. And so at the time of the French Revolution, the French revolutionaries decided that they would fix this problem of there being uh, such a change in standards from one part of the country to another. And they decided to institute uh, what we now call the metric system. And the basis of the metric system was gonna be a unit of length called the meter. 
it was going to be the measure of all things. And it was supposed to be something that was available to everyone. And they figured the earth was something that belonged to everyone. And so they defined the meter to be one ten millionth of the distance between uh, the North Pole and the equator on a meridian that goes through Paris. And in order to determine what the actual length of a meter was, they sent out a team of, um, of surveyors to determine that uh, length difference uh, uh, between uh, the pole and the equator by measuring some fraction of it and then extrapolating. And here was a medal that was cast to commemorate that idea. And you see there's a mythological creature actually measuring the earth. And the idea, the, the, the dream that they had was that they would have a, a measure of length that would be good for all time and for all people. And so they sent out their surveyors to do the actual measurement of the earth symbolized here. And they came back with a measurement based on the old system of, of measurements. And they realized that it wasn't very convenient to continually be measuring the earth. And so instead they made an artifact. They made a standard just like the ancient Egyptians did. And here is a picture of the meter of the archives deposited in the year 1799 uh, that em embodied this measurement of the earth that had been done. But a very modern uh, approach that was very much in the, in the spirit of the ancient Egyptians. A few decades later, there was an international meeting called the Convention de Maître that uh, decided that the meter would now become the international standard of length. The various countries of the world that uh, signed the treaty of the meter agreed that the meter would be the, their standard of measurement. And they agreed to make a new version of the meter. And here's a picture of what the new meters look like. And this was a, a, a bar made out of platinum iridium. And the distance between two scratches on that bar was the new meter. Uh, so now you had an international version of this, uh, uh, this, this new measure that's supposed to be the measure of all things. But one of the problems was that almost immediately, as soon as this new length standard uh, was made, people realized that they had other ways of measuring length that were much superior to using um, a metal bar with scratches on it. The distance between two scratches is quite difficult to measure because you use a microscope to measure it. The microscope can only resolve something at about one millionth of a meter. And the scratch is wider than that in any case. And where is the middle of a scratch? So uh, it became difficult for people to use this new definition of a meter to make really precise measurements. What they were able to do was to use interferometry. In the latter part of the 19th century, in France and in other parts of the world, uh, interferometers were being made. The idea is you take a source of light, this might be light from a lamp, uh, a discharge lamp that, that made a very pure color, like this red color that comes from cadmium, and the light comes into a beam splitter. Some of the light goes to a, a movable mirror. Some of the light goes to a fixed mirror. And the two um, mirrors reflect the light back. They combine and create an interference pattern where the waves of the light that's coming this way line up with the waves of the light coming this way. Then you get a bright area. And when they're out of register, when they cancel each other out, then you get a dark spot. But here's the point about these wonderful interferometers. If you move this mirror just a quarter of a wavelength of light, which is on the order of 100 nanometers, a tenth of a millionth of a meter, if you move smaller than the, the uh, uh, much smaller than the rev resolution of an optical microscope, then this central spot will change from being dark to being bright. So that meant that people could easily measure lengths uh, to a precision that was far greater than what you could get with the, um, uh, with the meter bar and its scratches. This was totally inadequate to 
to make measurements of the sort that were being made with interferometry. And so in 1960, which by the way was the year that the laser was invented, the meter was redefined as a certain number of wavelengths of light from a certain kind of lamp that had krypton in it. Here's a picture of that lamp. When it was operating, it would produce uh, orange light and the wavelength of that orange light was now defined. Uh, so just as in the case of the, um, uh, uh, of, of the atomic clock, we used an atom to define uh, length. Now, the trouble was 1960, as I mentioned, was the year the laser was invented. It wasn't very long before laser light uh, was so good that it was much better than the light from this sort of a lamp. And so people started to use lasers as de facto standards of length. They were not the official standard of length, but they worked so much better than the official standard of length that everybody started to use them as the unofficial standard of length. And so it was clear that once again, the meter needed to be redefined. And the obvious choice what would have been to have defined the meter in terms of these new lasers, in particular, in terms of a helium neon laser stabilized to a transition in molecular ionine. But fortunately, the metrologists of the time did not make the obvious choice. They made a brilliant choice. They defined the speed of light. So what do I mean by that? The new definition of the meter is that the meter is the length of path traveled by light in a certain time interval. And of course, we have cesium clocks to define that time interval. And that means that you have effectively defined the speed of light. Because if the meter is the length that light travels in a certain length of time, then that length of time, the inverse of that is the speed of light in meters per second. What it means from a practical point of view is that if you have any kind of light and you measure its frequency, which by 1983 people had learned how to do, because the speed of light is defined, you immediately know what the wavelength is. You simply solve this equation for the wavelength, it's equal to C divided by the frequency, and you've got a standard of length for any light that you want. If somebody makes better lasers, and they did, if somebody improves the method for measuring the frequency of laser light, and they did, those improvements are already incorporated into this new definition. Uh, Jan Hall and Ted Hench were leaders in making better lasers and in making better measurements of the frequency of light. They got the Nobel Prize in 2005. Their work revolutionized length metrology, but we didn't have to change the definition because it was already part of these improvements that, uh, that Hall and Hench made. And so the key concept is we started with an artifact changed to an atom with its unchanging properties that still were difficult to use to some degree, and then changed to defining a fundamental constant of nature, the speed of light. And the beauty is that we should never need to change the definition of again. again. As technology improves, we don't need to change the definition. The definition of the speed of light incorporates all the possible improvements that we might anticipate in the future. So let's stop here and see if there are any questions about this part or about the last part. Yes, uh, Professor Phillips, there are a couple of questions. Uh, uh, let me start with one. Uh, so one question from Pratyumna, it says, in fact, this also, I must confess also my question as well. Uh, why we take uh, cesium-137 atom for atomic clock? Why not other atoms? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Good question. Uh, when the decision was made about cesium, which was in the mid-1960s, there were a number of, uh, of important considerations. One is that among the non-radioactive um, alkali atoms, cesium is the heaviest. And being the heaviest, having the, the, the biggest nucleus, it also makes the hyperfine frequency the highest. So that means that if there are any effects that, uh, for example, a magnetic field that might shift the frequency by a certain amount, because the frequency is higher, that shift is going to be a smaller fraction. 
So it was a good idea to have a high frequency because errors will be smaller fractionally with that higher frequency. Cesium being extremely heavy means that for the same temperature, the cesium atoms are moving more slowly. And it's better to have the cesium atoms move slowly because uh, the Doppler shifts and uh, the, uh, the limited observation time will all be improved if uh, cesium, uh, if you have an atom that's moving more slowly. It also turns out that the vapor pressure of cesium is pretty high. You don't have to warm up cesium very much to get a reasonable amount of vapor pressure. And that also means that the, uh, the velocity of the cesium atoms will be less than if um, uh, the, the temperature had to be a lot higher. And another very important point is that the cesium atoms were easy to detect. The ionization potential for cesium is very low. It doesn't take very much energy to remove the last valence electron from a cesium atom. And there's a phenomenon called surface ionization, where if a cesium atom um, uh, hits a surface of certain metals like uh, uh, titanium or tungsten, um, that have a high work function, that is, it takes a lot of energy to pull an electron out of those metals. If a cesium atom sits on such a surface, the metal will draw the electron into the metal, leaving an ion of cesium. The ion is easy to detect. And so it makes the, the detection of cesium very easy. So all of these reasons um, went into choosing cesium as the best thing for an atomic clock. Now today, we have other reasons. It turns out cesium is easy to detect using lasers. And cesium is easy to laser cool. So we can get cesium colder than any of the other uh, alkalis through laser cooling. And uh, so this is also very nice for, for cesium. So cesium has continued to be an excellent choice for uh, an atomic clock. The only disadvantage that cesium has that I can think of is that collisions between very cold cesium atoms, and I'm talking about really cold cesium atoms, so our cesium atoms are cooled down to one millionth of a degree above absolute zero. Collisions between those kinds of cesium atoms shift the clock frequency a lot. So we have to be very careful about that. So that's the very long answer to the, the simple question. Lots of good things about cesium. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, the next question from Amit Basu. Uh, is there any scope to see Earth's rotation in terms of quantum mechanically uh, qu sorry, in terms of quantum mechanical entanglement in atomic clocks in two different parts of the globe? <laughs> well, people have talked about using uh, quantum mechanically entangled uh, clocks to improve the performance of the atomic clock. So the idea here is uh, when I make the measurements on an atomic clock, because it's a quantum system, I'm making what are essentially quantum measurements. And um, what I'm measuring is how many cesium atoms have made the quantum transition between the two hyperfine states. So I start with a certain number of cesium atoms and I try to make a good calibration so I know how many cesium atoms I start with. I shine in microwaves and I find out how many atoms made the transition. I do that by measuring how many atoms are in one state and how many atoms are in the other state. Now, since it's a quantum transition, there is an uncertainty associated with making that transition. We call this quantum projection noise. So for identical circumstances, say if we started with exactly the same number of atoms and we shine exactly the same microwaves onto the atoms for exactly the same amount of time, we are not going to get the same number of atoms making the transition every time. There will be a fluctuation that's on the order of the square root of the number of atoms. So you'd like to have a lot of atoms and we do that, but there's a limit to how many atoms we can have. So you might like to have another clock and it will have still more atoms and that's great. And that will improve the performance of the clock, but it'll only improve the performance uh, like the square root of the number of atoms. 
But if you can entangle the atoms, then it's possible to beat uh, this uncertainty principle limit. You're not really beating the uncertainty principle. What you're going to do is you're going to shift the uncertainty that the uncertainty principle demands into something you don't care about. And that will allow you to make a frequency measurement that's more precise than what would be the case if you didn't entangle the atoms. So you're not stuck with the shot noise, the square root of n. Uh, you can go to something in principle, if you were very good at entangling all of the atoms in all the clocks, you could have the precision scale like one over n instead of one over the square root of n. So people have, uh, have imagined having constellations of uh, atomic clocks orbiting the earth uh, entangled so that the improvement would go like the square root, instead of like the square root of the number of satellites, it would go like the improvement would go like the number of satellites. So that would be an improvement. But we're, I think we're a long way from doing that. But we are now making atomic clocks where the atoms in a single instrument are entangled, and this is producing a quantum advantage. So uh, we're making a lot of progress in that, in that area. Okay, uh, Philip, let me ask you uh, the third one. Probably uh, there's one more question, but that we'll take uh, after your presentation. Uh, so the, uh, the question is from Ranjan Das, and it says, would Earth's magnetic field not affect this frequency? Yeah, well, the magnetic field does affect the frequency. It's just that we do a lot of work to try to make sure that the, the effect is small enough uh, that uh, it doesn't bother us, or at the very least that we can correct for it. So first of all, we use two states in the cesium atom that are first order insensitive to the magnetic field. So some of the states change their, their energy linearly with the magnetic field. We use states that change their energy quadratically with the magnetic field. Then we use magnetic shields so that we shield out uh, the magnetic field of the earth, the maybe stray magnetic fields that might be in the laboratory. These things are shielded out using uh, uh, a substance called mu metal, which has a very high magnetic permeability so that the magnetic fields cannot penetrate. Then we measure the frequency for the uh, transitions that do depend linearly on the magnetic field. This allows us to calibrate the magnetic field and correct for whatever residual uh, magnetic field uh, there is. Uh, so all of those things go together to, uh, to allow us to, to manage the, the magnetic field shifts. It's not that they don't exist, it's just that we manage them. Okay, uh, I do see more questions. I'm afraid I'm not sure whether we can go uh, too many at the moment. And if you're okay, I'll just take one question from YouTube and there are more questions piling up on the Zoom. Uh, okay. Let me ask a question uh, which is posed by Rudra Jyoti Palit. Uh, what are the challenges of using 229 thorium as a nuclear clock? Ah, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, uh, so th this is a pretty advanced question. And in fact, I was going to touch on this idea later in the talk, but let me say a few words about it now. Right now, we are considering changing the definition of the second because we have other uh, atoms that can uh, make better clocks even than cesium. But the question is about an even more advanced idea, and that is not using a transition in an atom, but using a transition in a nucleus. It turns out that there's a pair of nuclear energy levels uh, in the thorium nucleus that um, uh, are close enough together that you can make laser light by multiplying the, the frequency of the laser light so that it corresponds to the frequency of this nuclear transition. And uh, this nuclear transition is extremely long lived so that it's an extremely narrow transition and, and promises the, uh, the possibility of clocks that are even better than our best atomic clocks. 
Now, the question was, what about the challenges? Well, one of the big challenges is that no one has ever induced this transition. We know that it's there by virtue of measuring um, uh, decay energies from levels, uh, from other levels in the nucleus. We know about this, this transition, but no one has directly uh, induced the transition, which is what you need to do to make, a, to make a, in this case, not an atomic clock, but a nuclear clock. Uh, so uh, why is that? Well, probably because we just haven't worked hard enough yet to find uh, the transition because it's not easy. Uh, you have to uh, make the, the rather high frequency much higher than, than ultraviolet uh, light frequency uh, to excite this nuclear transition. Uh, and the nuclear transition is so narrow that if you don't get it exactly right, then nothing's going to happen. So we often say that finding the transition is like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's a very tiny, tiny thing, a very narrow transition, and you could easily miss it if you don't tune the, uh, 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 the laser uh, to just the right, uh, the right frequency. You might tune it across, you know, step from one frequency to an next, next, and you might miss the transition entirely. So people are looking for it right now and it's hard, but I feel confident that, uh, that these experiments will succeed. Yeah, uh, so uh, Philip, I think then we will proceed. There are a couple of more questions. We'll take it up maybe at the end. Okay, excellent. These are great questions. So this new definition of the meter that has to do with the speed of light is both brilliant and beautiful. Now, what I'm here to really tell you about is that on the 20th of May, 2019, what we did was we brought this same beauty to the kilogram and for that matter, to the ampere, the Kelvin and the mole. Now, why did we have to do that and how was it done? Well, to answer that question, I want to give you a light history of mass. In ancient times, we had mass standards. In ancient Babylonia, they used polished stones like the ones you see here as their mass standards. Uh, in ancient India, there were mass standards as well. Uh, here's uh, uh, a Shah uh, weighing his son on a balance using uh, standards that are, that are put on the other side of the, uh, the balance. But the problem was, the same as the problem we've always had with these kinds of standards is that they would vary from one place to another. And so the French revolutionaries taking the same approach as they did to the meter and wanting to have the meter be the measure of all things came up with a new mass standard. And the new standard of mass was called the kilogram and it was the mass of one liter of water. Now, one liter of water is a cube of water, one tenth of a meter on a side. So this was the new standard of mass. The problem was it wasn't very easy to get exactly one liter of water. Uh, water wets uh, the surfaces of things that it's in contact with. Uh, the density of water changes with temperature and people decided that they needed to do what they'd done for all the other standards. They made an artifact. So here is a picture of me holding the um, uh, kilogram of the archives. This is the artifact that was deposited in the archives of France in the year 1799 that became the standard of mass for all of France. So it's very much a return to the ancient practice. At first, they wanted to make something that would be good for all time and for all people, but they ended up forced by practicality to have an artifact, something that would be only available to the people who had it. And just as in the case of the meter, decades later at the uh, 1875 Convention de Maitre, uh, they, uh, the international community agreed to adopt the kilogram as the standard of mass. And they made a new version of the kilogram called the International Prototype of the Kilogram, made out of platinum iridium. It was made to be the same mass as the mass of the, um, uh, of, of the kilogram of the archives that was, uh, was made in 1799. This object, which you see right here, 
is the last artifact. Here I am with the actual kilogram of the archives. A long time ago, you can see that my beard was, was dark and my hair was dark, uh, but now my beard is white. <laughs> uh, so this was the old definition that the kilogram is the mass of the international prototype of the kilogram. Now think about this. We are in the 21st century. The unit of mass is an artifact, a piece of metal that was made in the 19th century, and it's based on an object made in the 18th century, the kilogram of the archives. This is scandalous. If somebody puts their fingerprint onto the international prototype of the kilogram, the rest of the universe loses weight. That's an intolerable situation. Well, nobody has uh, left their fingerprint on the kilogram, but it nevertheless appears to be changing. Here is a plot that shows the mass of a number of copies uh, of the international prototype of the kilogram. So they're made in exactly the same way, as, as closely as anybody could do, to make them the same as the, um, uh, as the actual international prototype of the kilogram. And now they're measured over a period of almost a century. They are measured... Uh, against the international prototype of the kilogram. And you'll notice they're all changing and they're almost all changing in the same direction. So it doesn't take too much imagination to uh, believe that it's actually the international prototype of the kilogram that is changing. But of course it cannot change because legally it is always a kilogram by definition. This is the intolerable situation and it has to be changed. So, um, well, I realize that we haven't uh, uh, gone very far with this last little bit, but before I go on to a description of how we're going to fix that, if anybody has any questions about mass, maybe we can uh, uh, answer them now. There are uh, definitely more questions that are piling up, but maybe one question we'll take so that we can move on with the slides, sir. So this is again from Procube, no? Uh, so you said we are measuring the unit using helium neon laser. Uh, nowadays we have many other advanced laser types. Uh, why can't we use those? And we do. The answer is that we do use any laser that you want can be used. The helium neon laser was being used as a de facto standard before the redefinition of the meter in 1983. After the def definition uh, of 1983 that defines the meter in terms of the speed of light, the beauty is you can use any laser you want. So if you've got a better laser than a helium neon laser, and we certainly have better lasers today, then you can use that and that can be used as your standard of length. The only requirement is that you'll be able to measure its frequency. And today, because of the work of people like uh, Hench and Hall, measuring the frequency of lasers is relatively easy. So you can use any laser you want. That's the real beauty of the new definition. Okay. Uh, so I guess maybe we can, okay, there's one more question, but uh, I, I prefer if you could uh, move on and then maybe uh, we'll take some questions at the end. Okay, good. So we have to fix the, the kilogram problem. And we wanna use the same beautiful approach that we used for the meter. When we redefined the meter, we defined the speed of light. So what shall we define? What constant of nature can we define in order to define the kilogram? Well, to understand that, I want to remind you of what is surely the, uh, the most famous equation in history. E equals mc squared. What does that mean? It means that the energy of an object whose rest mass is m is given by mc squared, where c is the speed of light. The total energy of an object at rest is its rest mass times the square of the speed of light. Now let's take another equation, not quite as famous as E equals mc squared. This tells us the energy of a photon, a particle of light. It's equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of the light. Now let's combine those two equations and solve for the mass. It says mass is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency divided by the square of the speed of light. What does that mean? It means that if you had a particle, like say an atomic nucleus, 
and it emitted a photon, a gamma ray, that had a frequency f that you can measure because you've defined the speed of light. And if you define Planck's constant, then you know what the change of mass of the particle is. So if we define Planck's constant, having already defined uh, the speed of light, then that means we have a new way of defining mass. Now, we won't in fact weigh photons. We could and we do, but not well enough. But instead there's a device invented by this guy named Brian Kibble uh, called uh, uh, Kibble balance or Watt balance. And here's the principle of operation. So first I want you to remember <clears throat> how we weigh things. Let's say that we have an unknown mass. So here's our unknown mass. The way we weigh something is we put known masses on the other side of the balance until the balance balances. So this uh, cartoon is imagining that we keep adding weight until the balance balances. And now we know that this unknown mass is equal to the sum of these known weights. This is the way we've always weighed things, fine. But of course it's subject to the fact that, that these standards of mass may drift uh, for reasons that we don't yet understand. So I want you to now think of another way that it might be possible to measure the, uh, the mass. Let's imagine that we replace the other side of the balance with a coil of wire that moves in a magnetic field. The, if, if the coil of wire carries a current and it's immersed in a magnetic field, there's gonna be a force because uh, magnetic fields exert uh, a force on, uh, on currents. So if we could generate the current that you see in this, in this coil and generate a magnetic field that we know, you see, that's the idea. Let's, let's imagine that we have a known current we know where the current goes. We have a known magnetic field. We know the direction in which the magnetic field points. Then we should be able to generate a force that we can use to balance the gravitational force of the unknown mass. And we will have measured the mass. This is an alternative way of doing it. The trouble is that we don't know how to measure the magnetic field and certainly not uh, measure its direction uh, as well as we need to, to do this experiment. And here's where the genius of Kibble comes in. What Kibble says is, let's take that coil that we put current in before, and let's take the, the, the coil's wires and connect the coil to a voltmeter. And now when we move the coil in the field of the magnetic uh, uh, field, then it generates a voltage because this is just like a, uh, like a generator. You move a wire in a magnetic field, you'll get a voltage on the wire. Let's measure the voltage. And let's also measure the velocity at which the coil is measured. We call this the velocity mode. So if we measure those two things, the voltage generated and the velocity of the coil, then this turns out to give us all the information that we need about the geometry of the magnetic field and the geometry of the current that we couldn't measure well enough. And then we do what we already did. That is we put a current in, we uh, uh, have this magnetic field and we see what current is needed to balance uh, the, uh, the unknown mass. This is called the weighing mode. And when we combine these two, um, uh, these two kinds of measurements, we get everything that we need. So let's go. So here's what we find out, that the mass that we get from the force, uh, from the weighing mode, because mass times the acceleration of gravity is force, multiplied by the velocity from the velocity mode is equal to the current from the weighing mode times the voltage from the velocity mode. Why? Because the force times the velocity is mechanical power, and current times voltage is electrical power. And in any proper system of units, these two things have to be equal to each other. So we solve for the mass and we find that our mass, the thing we wanna measure is the current times the voltage divided by the acceleration of gravity times the velocity. Now you may ask, but wait a minute, how does this involve Planck's constant? And the way it involves Planck's constant is 
that we can measure both the current and the voltage using quantum techniques that involve Planck's constant. And we get this from the quantum Hall effect, from Klaus von Klitzing, and the Josephson effect from Brian Josephson. Here's Brian Josephson. Here's Klaus von Klitzing. Brian Josephson tells us that the voltage across a superconducting junction uh, uh, is related to uh, the frequency of the current going through that by 2 e over h in hertz per volt. Klaus von Klitzing tells us that the cross resistance of a, uh, of a semiconductor uh, carrying uh, current and exhibiting the Hall effect in a magnetic field is uh, quantized in units of H over E squared in ohms. And then if we measure the voltage uh, using the Josephson effect, and we use the current, measure the current using a combination of the Josephson effect and the quantum Hall effect, we find that the current is proportional to the charge, the voltage is proportional to Planck's constant divided by the charge, and so the mass is proportional to Planck's constant, which is what I promised you. So are there any questions about this? I realized that was pretty fast. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh the question, uh, what could be the possible reason, okay, that you actually kind of, uh, when you are talking about the mass, uh, this question came up, so it is answered. So I, I guess maybe we can move forward. Um, there's one question, it's not exactly clear to me, but uh, it's from YouTube. It says, what is the reason at the base of the time dilation in bracket clock retardation of the atomic clocks? Yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. Yeah. It's. Uh, I, I wish I had a uh, a slide to to show about the um, uh, time dilation. The, the time dilation. I'll tell you what. Let's see. Maybe if I stop sharing, I hope this, this is going to work. And can you put me sort of full screen? <laughs> oh yeah, you are in full screen. Okay. Imagine a clock that is made by two mirrors. So my hands are supposed to represent two mirrors, and the ticking of the clock is a light beam that bounces between the two mirrors, okay? One tick for every round trip of the light beam, okay? Now let's imagine that that, uh, that clock is moving, okay, like that. And you're standing in the laboratory watching the ticking of the moving clock. If you moved along with the clock, you would see it going like this. But if you are at rest compared to the clock and the clock is moving, you see the light taking a, uh, a diagonal path. Now, one of the principles of relativity that Einstein taught us is that the speed of light is constant. No matter who looks at the light, they always see the same speed of light. So that means that you're gonna see that it takes longer for that clock to tick if the clock is moving. And that is one way of understanding why a moving clock runs slow. So I'll just leave it at that. It, it's one demonstration. You can do any number of other things. You can just, you can derive the Lorentz transformations and see that time has to run more slowly. But this simple version of, of, of a clock with light bouncing between two mirrors shows you that the moving clock has to be running slow because the light has to travel a longer distance. Yeah. So now what I'm going to do is to try to share my screen again. <laughs> okay. So and I hope that it works. <laughs> oh, sorry, you got unmuted. Can you please? Uh, so you got muted. So can you? Unmute? Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Now we can hear you. Okay, Actually, great. Uh, before you just go, there were a few questions which are all around the same question. Maybe if you can quickly answer this. Uh, could you comment uh, on the question of uh, the constancy of fundamental constraints? Uh, this is sure. from yeah. uh, G. Ravindra Kumar and also a few others on the YouTube. Right. So people have speculated, are the fundamental constants in fact constant? Now, that question really only applies to a certain class of constants. Take, for example, the speed of light. It has to be constant because we have defined it to be constant. It's constant because we define the meter in terms of the speed of light. So the speed of light cannot change 
because we've defined it. The same is true of Planck's constant. The same is true of the charge of the electron. If we want to ask about constants, whether they can change, we have to turn our attention to dimensionless constants. Those are the only kinds of constants where it makes sense to ask the question, do these constants change? Because the constants that have dimensions, those constants, their value depends upon our choice of units. It's, it's arbitrary what we choose for our units. And so the values of those constants are themselves also arbitrary. We want to think about constants where it doesn't matter what system of units we use, those constants will always have the same value, assuming that they don't change in time. What's an example? The ratio of the mass of an electron to the mass of the proton. That is a pure number. Uh, and if we see that number change, that's meaningful. Something that people are even more interested in is a constant called the fine structure constant. In the international system of units, it's um, uh, e squared over four pi epsilon naught h bar c. That combination of constants has no, uh, has no units. And so if you find that that constant changes with time, that's meaningful. Now, so far, we have not seen any of these constants change with time. And we're sure of that, uh, at least the ones that we've checked, we're sure of that at a level that is far better than we need to know it for as accurately as we can measure uh, of the various quantities. The improvements that have been made in the measurement of time have allowed us to measure possible changes in the fine structure constant better than ever before. But today we can be confident that the fine structure constant is not changing by more than a few parts in 10 to the 18 per year. Now there are some indications from astrophysical observations, from the observation of uh, spectral lines from distant galaxies, that uh, there may have been a change of the fine structure constant um, over cosmological times. But these measurements are very controversial and for the moment, there's no clear answer about that. So I hope that answers that question. Oh, thank you. So shall we go on? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so. So here is a picture of uh, the actual apparatus that is used to um, measure kilograms in the way that, uh, that Kibble described. Uh, it's good to about a part in 10 to the eighth, which is better than the amount by which we know uh, the, the platinum iridium kilograms are changing. So this is an example of the new, uh, uh, the new way of, of making kilograms. Here's a, uh, a part of the team that did this. They're so confident in their results that they have tattooed the new values of the fundamental constants onto their arms. So these people are really serious about metrology, just like the ancient Egyptians. Now, uh, I think the time is getting late, so I'm gonna skip over this. This is another way of getting mass by defining Planck's constant, and it involves making uh, a near perfect silicon sphere. And it's, it gives you the same kind of information that uh, the, the Kibble balance that I already talked about uh, gives you. And people all over the world have used either one or the other of these methods to uh, measure Planck's constant, because before Planck's constant was defined uh, in 2019, these measurements were effectively making measurements of Planck's constant. So here's a map that shows uh, some of the laboratories around the world uh, where these kinds of measurements are being made. And when everyone agreed, then they de decided to adopt uh, a redefinition uh, where Planck's constant would be defined and that would become the definition of the, uh, uh, of the kilogram, as well as a new definition of the ampere and the mole and the Kelvin. And at the uh, International or the General Conference of Weights and Measures, after a unanimous vote of 60 countries in the world, 
uh, to make this change, this was the, the movie that we saw. In celebration. It took more than 140 years. Groundbreaking science. And the agreement from the world scientific community. At times, it seemed impossible. Accurate. Precise measurements. Anytime. Anywhere. Fact. We, we did, did it. it. Ce l'abbiamo fatta. We have no special. Lolograms. Lei si è buoni. Woman to the man. This one and I wrote them. Proud and die. This one is a sadat. It is on schools. Please get it. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. So whenever I see that movie, it makes me think that if 60 countries of the world could unanimously agree on something like that, perhaps there is some hope for this fractious world that we live in. Well, it's not just the kilogram. As I mentioned, it's the ampere as well. The old definition of the ampere was that it was the current that produced a certain force between current carrying wires. Uh, the new definition defines the charge of the electron. So the ampere becomes a certain number of electrons per second. And the beauty is that now that we've defined both E and H, it means that these quantum values, 2A over H for the Josephson effect and H over E squared for the quantum Hall effect are now exact and can be used to measure all electrical quantities. Uh, the mole used to be the amount of substance that had a number of entities equal to the number of carbon-12 atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. And now it's just a number. We've defined the Avogadro constant, Avogadro's number. And finally, the Kelvin. It used to be 1 over 273.16 of the triple point of water. But now the Kelvin is defined by defining the Boltzmann constant. So this is a very microscopic and quantum way of thinking about temperature. That temperature is now seen as the uh, uh, measure of the kinetic energy, the thermal energy of the, the atomic and molecular constituents of whatever it is that's, uh, uh, whose temperature is to be measured. So the French Revolution brought us the metric system with meters as being this uh, new measure of length, the measure of all things, and kilograms as being the measure of mass. The 1875 Treaty of the Meter brought us an international agreement about the units. And then finally, uh, on the 20th of May, 2019, which is the anniversary of the signing of that uh, Treaty of the Meter, we've had that the biggest revolution in measurement since the French Revolution. That revolutionary spirit means that the world is finally free of artifact standards of measurement. All the base units are now defined by fixing the values of constants of nature, and the definitions are quantum, both in spirit and in the way in which we realize them. It seems as if the international system has been wrapped up in a nice package, finally realizing the dream of the French revolutionaries that would give us units that were good for all time and for all people. Except it seems for time itself, which is still tied to a specific atom, namely cesium, rather than to a fundamental constant. And as we discussed earlier, we now have other atoms and possibly sometime in the future, even a nucleus that might provide a better standard than the cesium atom. So we have clocks like this with atoms cooled to a micro degree, keeping time to a few parts in 10 to the 16. Dave Wineland with a single ion uh, making optical transitions near 10 to the 15 hertz instead of near 10 to the 10 hertz, good to parts in 10 to the 19. And in very recent results from the, the lab of, of Jun Yi and with the help of, of Anna Maria Ray, who does the, uh, uh, the essential theory to understand how these clocks work, they're now 
using strontium atoms to give results that are accurate to eight times 10 to the minus 21, just astoundingly accurate. This represents milliseconds in the age of the universe. And so we're going to have to redefine uh, the second. It's inevitable that we will do so, but it doesn't appear that it'll be the final redefinition because we don't have a fundamental constant uh, that will satisfy the needs of modern and future frequency metrology. And so for the future of time, only time will tell. And so I'll be happy to take any more questions. Excellent way to end your presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Phillips. So, uh, Okay, so there are a few questions. Uh, in fact, uh, right at the end, I see uh, Professor Sunil Gupta. Uh, yeah, please go ahead and ask uh, your question. I'll also take up a few more after that. Uh, thank, thanks, uh, Bill. Uh, that was a master class, uh, which I <laughs> knew was coming. Okay. Um, well, uh, you told us all about it, but how long do you think before your compatriots will accept SI units? in US. <laughs> ah, well, uh, I want to point out that the United States was one of the original countries that signed the Treaty of the Meter in 1875. Right. So in 1875, we accepted the metric system in the United States as our <laughs> standard of measurement. We have not kept separate standards that are different from metric since even earlier, by the middle of the 19th century, the United States had defined all of our standards of measurement in terms of the metric system. And as one of the original signers of the Treaty of the Meter, uh, we were one of the original supporters of the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, who uh, are the international body that brings everybody together and makes these kinds of decisions. NIST, the um, well, the United States Standards Laboratory was one of the big uh, mo motivators behind this change of the, uh, of the metric system. So we are uh, entirely metric. It's just that we haven't adopted it in daily life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I had a more serious question. Uh, uh, okay, so, uh, you know, uh, as this definition has changed, now one of the things which, as you know, uh, the way... Uh, the year is defined, uh, you know, the introduction of leap seconds, et cetera, is all based on the fact that the earth is slowing down. And for, for measuring those things, so we make measurements of uh, do lunar ranging, right? So you get to know uh, to millimeter precision. A and similarly, you know, for example, uh, okay, so that is what leads to UTC, how many leap seconds are introduced, et cetera. So do you think uh, this introduction, this redefinition of time is going to affect, are we going to have to add a leap second or remove, or is it too small a change? Well, that's a good question. The usual way when you make a, def a redefinition is that it is made to be continuous with the old definition. The only way we're going to avoid leap seconds is if we were to actually shift the definition of the second. Now, I recently learned that, that the main reason why we have leap seconds is not so much that the earth is slowing down, which it is on average, it's because they made a mistake in 1960 when they redefined the second in terms of the year 1900. Instead of redefining it in terms of the mean solar day that existed at the moment, they did it based on the mean solar day over a long period of time in the past. And so they were not making the second equal to the mean solar day second that was current at the time, but rather to some, some historic average. And that was why we ended up with leap seconds because they just chose the wrong value for the second. Okay. But I'm afraid it's too late. It's too late to change to something okay. decent. Yeah. Now, and the, please go but there's still a question as to whether we're gonna keep on with leap seconds. A lot of people say, why bother? It's only a few seconds. It's not going to affect anybody. Sure, you can make speculations and say that, that many, many centuries in the future, instead of the sun being highest at noon, it's going to be highest at one o'clock. But look, we don't 
live on solar time anyway. India sets its clocks a half an hour different from uh, uh, the rest of the world. Uh, the state of Arizona has three different time zones in the United States. We already do crazy things with time. So I think that a lot of people think, let's not worry about leap seconds. Let's just go with atomic time forever. But the astronomers like the leap, leap seconds. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, since you are talking about time and also the Indian Standard Time, uh, we have the director of uh, NPL, National Physical Laboratory, uh, Professor Gopal. Yeah, he's he's there on the on the screen. Uh, let me bring him. Uh, maybe he wants. Hello, to say hi. I'm very glad to see you from our sister Thanks. laboratory. <laughs> So yes, so I, I'm 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 new to the game, so trying to learn all these things. So it's it's a very nice talk, and uh, I hope like this class. I often get like last four months I've been asking, uh, been asked this question by many people. Like, so what's the big deal? Why do you want precision, and uh, why do you want to spend so much time and effort in it? So it's really an interesting talk where I could learn a lot. And uh, thank you. And, Thanks very much. I'm very happy to meet you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gopal, for some of it. I'm sure you must be on the move somewhere, but uh, thanks for just pitching thank in. You. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so going back on the uh, questions, I, I'm sorry to the participants. Of course, we are going a little um, outside the uh, time, but because uh, the talk has invoked such an interesting discussion, we would uh, close in about 10 minutes. Uh, so let me take a few questions very quickly. Uh, so again, from Pratyu, uh, will the new standard uh, standards of unit affect the light year measurements? <laughs> well, uh, that's a good question. I don't really know. I'm not, not being an astronomer. Uh, I don't deal in light years very much. I know there is some discussion about what a year should actually be. Because as you know, uh, uh, the sort of conventional year has 365 days, but sometimes it has 366 days. Uh, and we do this to adjust for the fact that the actual uh, length of the year uh, is uh, uh, not an even number of days. There's no reason why the rotation of the earth around the sun should be related in some integer to the rotation of the earth on its axis. So uh, the question is what constitutes a light year? And this is a, a subject of some discussion. My own feeling is that we should define a year to be 365 days, and we should define a day to be 60 times 60 times 24 seconds. And then it's very clear and it's not related to the, uh, uh, the actual revolution of the earth around the sun. It's just related to a conventional uh, definition, but this is something that's under discussion. Uh, somewhat similar, two questions I'll ask one after the other. Uh, in the expression of mass, uh, G was involved. How precise yeah. that it is known to us? Yeah, well, so, uh, that's, that's a very good observation. And uh, what it means is that if you do this measurement, uh, you have to make a measurement of G in the laboratory where you're uh, uh, doing the other measurements because G changes um, uh, from one place to another on the earth. And not only that, it changes with time on the earth. The tides that cause the the ocean uh, uh, level to rise and fall also distort the earth itself and they distort uh, gravity, the acceleration of gravity at the surface of the earth. So in order to do this correctly, you have to uh, make very precise measurements of gravity. And the beauty is to answer the question that can be done to a few parts in 10 to the nine. So it is not the limiting factor in, um, in realizing the kilogram. Uh, and um, you have to make corrections for what time of the day it is and what time of the year it is in order to, uh, to really do this correctly. So all that has to be done. Fortunately, we know how to do it. Okay, I now switch, uh, switch over to YouTube. A uh, few quick questions. 
um, how does uh, this is Poonam Arora? How does the laser line width limit the cooling efficiency of atoms? Yeah. So, uh, so this you know is, is touching on on the the other thing that I do, <laughs> which is laser cooling. It turns out that um, for the laser cooling of something like um, like cesium atoms, uh, that the, the, the laser line width does not have to be that good. The line width of cesium itself is about five megahertz. It's really easy to have lasers that have a line width much less than five megahertz. And it turns out that as long as your cooling laser's line width is significantly smaller than the natural line width of the transition, then there's no problem with the cooling. Now, there are some other atoms like strontium that have forbidden transitions that um, give you much narrower lines and people do laser cooling on these narrower lines. And so you have to do a little bit better with, uh, uh, with your laser. So, um, uh, but again, it's not the sort of thing that's particularly difficult in a, um, it, uh, in a well-experienced laser laboratory, the kind of line widths that are needed to get the best performance out of laser cooling are, are pretty easy. The hard part comes when you want to use these laser cooled atoms to make an atomic clock. The typical thing in the modern atomic clocks, uh, the ones that are good to a part in 10 to the 18th or better, is we're looking at optical transitions. That means that the laser that probes that optical transition has to be incredibly narrow. Uh, and the best of these lasers are now a tiny fraction of one Hertz in line with, and that's not so easy to do. And so in order to do that, you really have to uh, be in, uh, in one of the, uh, the state of the art laboratories. Uh, and uh, but it's it's the kind of state of the art that's getting better all the time, and I think that it's going to uh, be the sort of thing that will be routine in metrology laboratories like like the NPL, both in India and in the UK, and in uh, similar laboratories all over the world. This is 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 going to be standard uh, uh, metrology practice, but it's not the sort of thing that that your average uh, laser laboratory can do easily. It takes a lot of work, but that's not for laser cooling. That's for doing the clock. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid we are coming close to 11 a.m. And in, uh, you know, IST, I'm sure uh, you passed midnight, uh, but uh, I can't stop taking this one question from one more question from YouTube uh, again. The kilogram is defined in terms of Planck's constant, but the Planck's constant itself has a kilogram in it. So how do we solve that? <laughs> well, of course, it's the only, the only way that you could use Planck's constant uh, to define a kilogram is if it contains the kilogram uh, in itself. If it didn't, then Planck's constant would be irrelevant for defining the kilogram. I think the problem is that it seems circular. And that's because you have to remember that we've given up the old definition of the kilogram. So before 2019, Planck's constant depended upon the kilogram and it depended upon that old definition of the kilogram. Uh, so you couldn't, uh, it, it, you can't have two different definitions of the kilogram at the same time. So once we decided we were gonna give up the old definition of the kilogram, then we can have a new definition of the kilogram and that new definition defines Planck's constant. The old definition of the kilogram would not allow Planck's constant to be defined because it would overconstrain the system. But once we gave up the old definition, then that constraint on the system of units that came from the old definition was gone. And that allowed us to, to uh, define um, what, the, uh, what Planck's constant was. Just like we couldn't define the speed of light if we insisted on the old definition of the meter. But once we gave up the definition of the meter based on the distance between two scratches, then we can define the speed of light. 
uh, though I said that is last question, but the question that came up is something close to my heart uh, involving the students and uh, you know academics. So I would like to. This is really, really the last one. Uh, okay. So the question from Hema Malini, really. So how can we go into precision accuracy, precision and accuracy with the daily life example to the new entrance of the college curriculum? Uh, so I guess uh, she meant how do we impart the importance of the precision accuracy of these units to, uh, to the students uh, getting into the, uh, into the college? Yeah, well, so I have to say that, that I haven't really talked about why precision in measurement is important. I've really only talked about how we can develop a system of units that allows us to have that kind of precision. Uh, if we didn't have these definitions of the units, we would not be able to make measurements with the highest level of precision because the units themselves would not be precisely defined. These new definitions allow us in many cases, to make measurements that are really good. But why is it necessary to make those measurements in the first place? Well, I think that's the, the, uh, the real uh, kernel of the, of, of the question that's, uh, that's being asked is, why do we need to make really precision measurements? And I, I'd like to answer the question in a couple of different ways. There are both practical reasons, that is things that affect our everyday lives. And there are scientific reasons, things that increase our understanding of the universe. And to see both of these kinds of things, let's think about clocks. Atomic clocks are the best timekeepers we've ever had. And it was the existence of atomic clocks that allowed us to define the second in terms of the uh, hyperfine frequency of cesium. But the clocks also gave us something else. The existence of such clocks gave us something else. And that was the satellite navigation system. The satellite navigation system in the US, the, the, the global positioning system, provides us a way of navigating anywhere on the surface of the earth to within a distance of a few meters, sometimes even a lot better. We can use it to find our way in automobiles to unfamiliar locations. We can uh, use that system to uh, navigate uh, uh, ships at sea, airplanes uh, uh, between airports. It's revolutionized the way in which we find our way from one place to another. That would have been impossible without the ability to make precise measurements of time using atomic clocks. So that was a really important uh, uh, application of the kind of precision in measurement that atomic clocks allow. You don't actually have to know what time it is to do that, but you have to have atomic clocks that are stable and precise and that everybody agrees are keeping the same time. That's one thing. Another thing we've already touched on, are the fundamental constants of nature in fact constant? It is atomic clocks that have allowed us to answer that question better than we've ever been able to answer it before uh, because we've never had uh, timekeeping that was as good as our atomic clocks are now. So these wonderful atomic clocks that are good to a part in 10 to the 18 or better have allowed us to check to see whether the constants are constants. If they're not, then it means we have to change our understanding of physics. And that will mean that we're gonna learn something really important that's new about, about the universe. So far, everything is, is constant, but it's one of those things that's really important from a fundamental point of view. So, so there are two examples of a very practical application of precision measurement and a very academic or intellectual uh, application of precision measurement of the same kind of precision measurement. Yes, uh, so uh, Dr. Phillips, I would have, in fact, we all would have loved to continue to hear for another hour or so, the way the, the talk was going on so so well, so beautifully touching up on so important aspects of all the, uh, you know, the units and in general, the, the, the constants of measurement. 
Uh, so it looked to me, you know, just like the topics of today's colloquium, your talk has been very accurate, very precise, very consistent. And it was just going like a song, like a, like a story for us. Uh, that is what I think is expected from Dr. William Phillips, indeed. Uh, so you really lived up more than what your uh, this one is. Uh, uh, you are known for. Uh, I'm afraid there are still uh, many questions left, both on both the chats, but uh, it's already past eleven o'clock uh, locally. So I would like to once again uh, thank immensely uh, for having agreed to talk on this uh, so important topic to all of us. We learned a lot today. And uh, we, I'm sure, uh, maybe at a later moment, we will uh, have an opportunity to physically have you uh, in the Tata Institute in India, and hopefully even the National Physical Lab, uh, where my uh, uh, colleague uh, Achenta is also there. And I think hopefully we'll, we'll have a much longer conversations and interactions at that time. And before I close, uh, I once again would like to thank Stephen, my colleague at American College uh, uh, for being responsible for today's talk and also Professor Sunil Gupta uh, for being on the call along with uh, Dr. Achinta. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, wish you... Can I, can I add one more thing? Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, okay. On, okay. On, a more, on, a, on a more culinary note, I know uh, Bill likes Indian food. So we, we assure you when you <laughs> visit here, we'll have the best of Indian cuisine. For, <laughs> waiting sure. for you. Sure, sure. So thanks, everyone. Thank uh, all the participants for asking such a nice questions that brought out even more insights into what uh, uh, Dr. Phillips have been saying. So thank you very much uh, for joining rather uh, the early morning hours as per Indian Standard Time. Uh, but uh, fantastic. It's a great, it's a great day to start uh, with Dr. Phillips. Uh, such a such a wonderful talk. Thank you very much. It's been thank a pleasure for me. Thank you, sir.